Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today at the 2020 virtual Fairfax County Public Schools Mental Health and Wellness Conference and ANOVA Act on Addiction Summit. This webinar series would not be possible without the generous support of Joan and Russell Hitt. Before I introduce our speaker, here are a few housekeeping notes. All participant lines have been muted and everyone's video has been turned off. We will be taking questions via the Q&A feature and they can be submitted at any time. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Our speaker for today is Dr. Sulman Mirza. Dr. Mirza is a triple boarded physician with board certifications in psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He currently works with children and adolescents at Inova Keller Center and is working with adults at his private practice, Lao Cow Psych, both offices are located in Sterling, Virginia. He is also affiliated with the National Basketball Players Association Mental Health and Wellness Program with the Washington Wizards. Take it away, Dr. Mirza. Hi, how's everybody doing today? Um, so I just wanted to kind of give a, a little bit of a heads up in that I was, you know, when I initially scheduled this, I was not thinking that I was going to be on vacation with my family. So I'm over here in the Outer Banks, but doing this and, uh, should be a little bit fun. I was going to be doing it a little bit outside, but it just started to rain, of course, so I had to shift inside. So a little, little some fun. So if there's any problems or anything like that, just let me know and we'll see what we can do. Uh, can everybody see me, hear me okay? I think so. All right, so we will get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about substance use disorders um, and how we can use telehealth and how we use those to help out with the treatment. So some of the outline learning objectives, some things that we want to kind of get out of this presentation is, A, we'll talk a little bit about myself, what, you know, who I am, why I'm someone to talk to about the situation. Um, what are some substance use disorders, SUDs? So if you see the acronym SUD, it just stands for substance use disorders. Talking a little about the definition of it, some of the demographics in this country as well. What is telehealth? What is telemedicine? What's a between them and you know a little history about them and how we can use them and then also understanding some of the treatment options for individuals with SUDs you know on, their, on a normal day-to-day -day basis and then also some of the unique challenges that come abroad come across during the situation with the pandemic uh, that we've been dealing with and also when there's stay-at-home orders and then finally kind of understanding what is the role of telehealth tele telemedicine and what we can do for treatment of patients with SUDs. One second. Oops, let me make a check real quick. Sorry, one second. I think I'm not sure if I'm doing the screen share. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties, I guess, initially. Okay. So we got that now. Okay. So that was, again, a little what we're planning to do. All right. Thanks, Megan, for the hookup with that. So a little introduction about me and who I am. So like we talked about, like um, I was by Shelby and Miss Megan, they kind of helped with the introduction. So board certified in psychiatry, um, child and adolescent psychiatry, and addiction medicine as well. Um, work, you know, my, my day job is working at a Nova Keller Center where I work primarily with children and adolescents. I uh, work for medication management, so kind of an outpatient basis, but I also work in the partial hospitalization program where we help people who help teens and adolescents who may not be quite at the level of needing inpatient, um, where they're struggling through depression, anxiety, and also with substance abuse. Also, I have a private practice, Loud Cow Psych, short for Loudoun County Psychiatry. Uh, where we help people with more adults, um, and one of the main focus is on addiction, so most specifically alcohol issues and also um, opioid issues. And again, I work with the National, Bento, no, National Basketball Players Association through their recently formed mental health and wellness program. Uh, this was in response to outcry, per se, from players like DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, who wanted to have access to mental health uh, providers and the kind of safe, secure um, environment, so through a vetted program. So that's something I do with it through the, through the wizard. 
And then just a cheap plug, I have, I just started a recent YouTube channel. It's called Tell Me More About Your Sneakers. And it's a discussion about, um, personally, like I, I'm a big sneaker fan, so I have sneaker collection and then also um, for um, mental health topics. So we usually try to have one mental health topic per session and, and talk about it as well as tying it in with, with sneakers. So fun, engaging and something we want to have, you know, have that conversation with people. All right. So substance use disorders. So a little bit of definition and some demographics about what's going on. So substance use disorders occur, whoops, when, they're, when the recurrent use of alcohol and or drugs causes clinically significant impairment, including health problems, disability, and failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, or home. This definition is from SAMHSA, which is a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And we can generalize this to um, anything essentially. So whether it's alcohol, opioids, nicotine, or anything like that, that's what we're gonna have as our general kind of definition of what qualifies as a substance use disorder or an SED. So here are some demographics through 2017. This is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, this is, you know, and this is just nationwide in America. So they saw that in individuals aged 12 and above, that there are 19.7 million Americans that have some struggle with some substances. Number one big thing is 74% of them struggled with alcohol. Um, we, we tend to overlook alcohol. We don't think about it as a substance that somebody abuses, but it absolutely is, and it's far and away the number one. 38% um, are some kind of illicit substance, and that includes marijuana, despite its kind of gray area legal status, because on a federal level, it's still considered illegal. So 12.5% of adults had issues with both alcohol and some other illicit substance. 8.5 million American adults had a co-occurring mental health disorder. And the estimated cost is $740 billion to um, society throughout the nation. That, that $740 million is lost productivity, um, treatment costs, um, and other things associated with that. So significant amount of money. When we talk about it in adolescence, again, this is, we'll kind of rush this a little bit. For adolescents aged 12 to 17, 4% struggled with at least one substance use disorder, 1.8% with alcohol, 3% um, with an illicit, mostly it's marijuana um, amongst this age range. Young adults, 18 to 25, this is where the big spike occurs, the real big issues. 14.8% of all young adults in America struggle with some substance use disorder, 10% with alcohol, 7.3% with an illicit uh, substance. Heroin use, interestingly enough, um, during the past decade has doubled. So that's something, again, we, we see a lot of news about it opioid crisis and heroin and its major comeback and this is something in this this group of people has been hit um, particularly hard adults over 26 um, 6.4 percent struggled with substance use disorder five percent with alcohol two percent with an illicit and then go to the elderly 65 and plus over a million of the 50 million elderly folks in america have some substance use disorder Almost overwhelmingly, it's all 97% of that million is, is alcohol use disorder. And the interesting thing is about two thirds of them develop alcohol use disorder before the age of 65. Um, and about 9% of those have an overlap or 9% have illicit substance use disorder. So a lot of it, mostly alcohol, um, but there are some other substances as well. And here's just a nice big pretty graph also to kind of uh, combine those two. So you can see the blue graphs are more alcohol only. Um, here we go. Again, that huge big spike that we see in, in the 18 to 25 population, and then kind of tapering off a little bit. Green is overlap with alcohol and another substance. So here you can see that another huge big, big chunk over here in this 18 to 25. And yellow is just a substance or an illicit substance. So again, pretty big in the younger age, 12 to 17. Again, marijuana, the most predominant one. And then over here, another big chunk in the 18 to 25. And then you can see it kind of tapers out a little bit as we grow on in life. Other de demographics are important to kind of rec recognize and realize is that it's a nearly two to one male to female ratio um, in substance use disorders 
Um, so while men may be more likely to abuse substances, the risk of progression to a use disorder is essentially equivalent so between the sexes. So it's, there's nothing that says men are more likely to become an alcoholic versus females. Um, there, it's more just there, the risk is there in regards to exposure and this, that experimentation is a little bit more often with males versus females. Other kind of demographics, nearly two to one for unemployed versus employed, 17% versus 9%. And over 65% of the 2.3 million individuals in prison and jails have some kind of substance use disorder. And then other, interestingly, 75% of those in prison and jail um, have with a mental illness struggle with, with a substance use disorder and vice versa as well. So 75% of those with a substance use disorder in jail have some mental health disorder. And then ethnic differences, which are important to understand as well. Native Americans, Alaskan Islanders have um, far and away the highest kind of percentage among them that struggle with the substance use disorder, 12.8%. Then we see it goes down to white, 77.7%, black, 6.8%, Latino, 66 Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, 46 And then Asian Americans have the lowest at around um, 3.9. I think it's covered right now by the thing, but uh, they have the lowest uh, percentage that are having some kind of substance use disorder. So we see that nice, that kind of that big kind of jump amongst this population, and then it comes down to down a bit. So again, here's another here's another kind of graphical representation just to show again, you know, the substances that are abused. Um, and the percentages are just not necessarily percentages, but the numbers. So this is in thousands. So 14,000, so this is 14,500,000 um, Americans have some substance use disorder that's struggling with alcohol. Again, this far outweighs everything else. You can see with marijuana at 4.1 million, opioids at one point, opioid painkillers, 1.7 cocaine, less than a million, heroin about 600 plus thousand, and it kind of tapers out a little bit. So again, we, we don't think about this because alcohol is legalized in America, but it is something that is so widely, widely abused and causes so many issues. It's so important to not underestimate the impact that alcohol has. So switching gears a little bit, switching over to telehealth, telemedicine, and, and what it is exactly. And what we'll say is telehealth is the use of electronic information or te telecommunications technologies to have long distance clinical health care, patient uh, professional health related education, health administration. So this includes video conferencing, store and forwarding imaging, streaming um, information, terrestrial and wireless communications. So essentially, this right here is telehealth. This is a, a, an instance of what we say telehealth, because even when we're using, we're not directly having clinical care we are having education that's for a health purposes and anything that can be along those, those lines is considered telehealth. So telemedicine, again, the main difference with it is that, that telemedicine comes more so in direct clinical care. So if I'm here as a medical doctor and I'm prescribing medication or providing clinical care, that would be telemedicine. So a little history of it. Um, this has been around as long as humanity has been able to communicate with each other. Um, back in Africa, back in the day, smoke signals would signal disease outbreaks to neighboring tribes. And this was a, well, we, we don't think about it, but it is an example of telehealth. Later in the 19th century, house calls, you know, shortly after Al Alexander Graham Bell came up with the phone, um, you know, that, that traveling and home doc that we would see in those old movies, you know, they were able to kind of in the middle of the night uh, I think the first instance that was recorded was somebody, it was a pediatrician, was able to diagnose, I think it was a whooping cough um, in the middle of the night. You know, he didn't have to come out there in the middle of the night and travel out there and, and you know, put the stethoscope on the kid. He was able to use, you know, the, the bell from the, um, from the phone and is able to diagnose whooping cough and prescribe, you know, medication, et cetera, from there. And then also during the American Civil War, the um, health reports, et cetera, was all kind of transmitted through uh, the phone lines during that time. 1950s is when the radiographs were able to travel over phone lines. We were able to kind of send um, x-rays and the like through the phone lines to kind of help um, over long distances. And, you know, the main thing is when when there was 
lack of access to radiologists in certain parts of the country or at certain times, um, having that ability to kind of reach out was extremely helpful. You know, even nowadays, right, if you go to the emergency room or urgent care in the middle of the night with a, you know, broken bone or valuing for that, there isn't usually a radiologist that's on staff. Um, and again, some of the smaller places, they usually send those electronically over to like India or Australia, I think, with some of the major companies and somebody over there reading them and then they're able to send them back. Um, NASA, you know, with space flight, you know, it really necessitated the remote physiological monitoring and how that was able to happen. So that was really push more of telemedicine and telehealth is in. And then Mass General Hospital in Boston, they were able to kind of set up at Logan Airport, you know, one of the biggest, I think it's the busiest airport in the country, um, that having a kind of an on-site clinic almost over there, but not necessarily on-site, but having somebody remote in a way to kind of be, be there for consults. And through the Mass General, also through the Veterans Affairs VA office in Boston, they were able to set up like a telepsychiatry um, clinic service in the 1960s and the 70s. So this has been around a while. It just has evolved with, with technology. And the big thing was the internet. So when the internet was invented and it kind of really put into use and people were able to see what was able to be done with it, we really saw this massive explosion in, in, in the kind of telemedicine, telehealth. So one of the big things was the switch as a whole to electronic health or, or electronic medical records, being able to e-prescribe. So we were able to send off the prescriptions, right, without having to have the paper prescriptions anymore. So which is great because there is, it cuts out, you know, prescriptions getting lost or the dog eating the prescription or misplaced and anything like that is able to go directly from the office to the pharmacy. It really eliminated a lot of transcription errors too. You know, doctors are notorious for having terrible handwriting. You know, and every once in a while when I have to write um, a prescription, I always look at them and it's like, wow, how can anybody anybody read this? Um, but again, if it's coming through a computer, there's that the errors really get reduced a whole lot. Teleradiology we talked about um, a little more. Also provided supervision for mid-level providers, for, for nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants, that ability to kind of jump in um, to sessions and really help supervision lies from, from, from an MD point of view. Um, Kaiser out in California and Kaiser Health Insurance as a whole, they've, you know, they were really pushing the whole telemedicine, telehealth aspect of things. In 2016, they actually showed that they were doing more virtual visits than in-person visits. You know, and especially a lot of times with um, chronic health conditions. So people needing to kind of be seen on a monthly basis or every few months who didn't necessarily need to come into the office all the time. They were able to kind of say like, hey, is everything going okay? And that's really what a lot of the benefits was shown from that. And then also when we think about it, the internet has also allowed us to kind of book our appointments and kind of review our doctors, doctors review our hospitals. So Yelp, ZocDoc, things like that, that is telehealth as well. You know, we're able to use that online to kind of go through their advertising through social media, online research as a whole, all these things, online reviews, so we can give feedback. Hey, Dr. Mirza did a terrible job, you know, with, with, my, with my child, and they can put it online and let everybody know. So that's part of the reality we're living in. And the other thing is the wild, wild web, right? So part of... So you know, these are some of the benefits of the internet. There's also negatives too, right? Um, you can have people who, who maliciously will post reviews, who will maliciously book things and just kind of, you know, book things up and just fill out the calendar. Um, so those are some of the issues. And then there is all the research that's out there. There's propaganda, there's convincing websites, there's false information that's out there to really potentially cause problems as well. So just because it's there doesn't mean it's always 100% positive. So there's always risks that come along with the internet as well. So one of those risks, right, the wild, wild web is, um, you know, it kind of leads into this, the next part is, so people were able to have virtual visits and anybody was just opening up shop and having their own doctor's office and you could show up and have a virtual visit like we're having right now and I could send off a prescription and it's all good. And what we saw is, you know, during, especially during the rise of like what would become the opioid epidemic is the overprescription, 
of opioid painkillers and medication, um, benzodiazepines, other kind of addictive, potentially abusable substances, um, that people were opening up shops, they were having lines out the doors, and then you just cash businesses and all these things that were going on, people were just having, setting up what we call quote unquote pill mills. Um, so that was some of the negatives that came about from it. And then um, what we saw is that 2001, there was a 18 year old, his name is Ryan Haight. He was, you know, a straight A student, you know, pretty good kid for all intents and purposes that we know about. Um, he died of a Vicodin overdose. Um, he had gotten the medication online. He had ordered it online through a doctor he never met. Um, and it was delivered through an online pharmacy. And he was able to get it prescribed to him, you know, just pay the money and that was that. And essentially died of an overdose, went to sleep, kissed his night, you know, kissed his mom the night before and then didn't wake up the next morning. So this kind of really prompted again more supervision and more more um, oversight. So this Ryan Hate Act was um, enforced or created in 2008. It's enforced by the DEA. Um, requires any prescriber who writes a prescription for a controlled substance to do an in-person medical evaluation initially, and then there needs to be a, you know, guidance is at least every 24 months another in-person evaluation. Um, and then also just with that, you know, again with the state licenses, you know, we we really limited, you know, the, all the medical, all the states said that if you have a medical license in Virginia, for example, you're only allowed to prescribe where the patient is. So if you, the patient, for example, are sitting in Arlington and I'm over in Sterling, we can work together. But if you're in Bethesda, Maryland, and I'm over in Sterling, Virginia, we're not able to kind of have that relationship together unless you come to my office and have that evaluation. So we can't just have somebody, again, these, this is what was popping up with these people in California, for example, and then they were seeing people in Florida, and just, again, you're paying me the money and I'm sending you the medication. And that's where a lot of the issues came about. And again, this Ryan Hate Act really came about to put a curb on that. Another issue that potentially showed up that caused some problems with the um, online with the telemedicine or limitation per se was insurance reimbursement. So despite numerous benefits, um, you know, again, increased access to providers and more rural areas and remote areas, and studies showing again that people with chronic medical conditions were doing really well. Insurance companies, a lot of them could not agree on reimbursement. And many companies, again, at some, at some point were not even reimbursing equivalently, equivalently or at all. So there was a lot of concern, a lot of issues in regards to uptick of, or kind of, um, what's it called, onboarding of telepsychiatry. It wasn't, if you're not gonna get paid for it, if you're not going to get reimbursed for the work that you're putting into it, why would anybody want to kind of get involved as a provider point of view? Why would you want to kind of start this whole process? So that was an issue that was an initial kind of issue. So switching back again, substance use disorders, some treatment options. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on alcohol, opioids, and benzodiazepines, and we'll go through this a little bit quicker. Alcohol treatment options, and you'll see a lot of these are similar as we have behavioral treatments through psychologists, counselors, there's also mutual support groups, AA Alcoholics Anonymous is the most famous one, SMART, self-management and recovery training, um, which is another kind of alternative to the faith-based system from AA that some people are, are not the biggest fans of, um, which again works for some people, but not everybody. Medication, Options for alcohol treatment are things like naltrexone, camphorol, and abuse. Um, the Sinclair method, which is a method of using naltrexone to help reduce alcohol intake. Um, and then there's also residential treatment centers and rehab centers. Alcohol cessation. So what's, you know, one of the questions that people say or one of the comments that people say is, well, if you have a problem with drinking, just stop drinking. And it's not that easy all the time, right? Because alcohol, the way that it biologically works, it works on a receptor in the brain, uh, the GABA receptor. And what that does is that it causes a physical dependence. So that if you do just stop drinking, you can have withdrawals, which can be extremely dangerous for some people, especially in heavy drinkers. Um, about anywhere between three to 10 days after your last drink, 
um, you can have something called delirium tremens or DTs. Um, they can last a few days. They are potentially dangerous. They are extremely dangerous, potentially fatal if untreated. Um, shaking, confusion, irregular heart rate and activity, sweating, hallucinations can occur. Um, they can be illusions as well. We can misrepresent, you know, like a light in the corner as a monster or pink elephant. So there is actually a beer called Delirium Tremens, which its logo is the pink elephant. Um, there are tactile hallucinations as well. People will experience something as if it's crawling on their skin. Fevers and seizures. Seizures can be, again, the fatal part. 15 to 40 percent of those without treatment can die of um, Delirium Tremens. Um, and oftentimes the treatment you know, will be having to be in an ICU level of care, which in and of itself can be extremely expensive and, and long lasting and, and problematic in itself. One to 4% of those will die. Uh, alcohol treatment outcomes. So it's really hard to measure because there is no defi definition of what is quote unquote recovery from alcohol use, but there was a publication back in 2001 which showed that when there was an intervention that was done about about a third, so 17.7 to 18.2 percent had 17.7 had low risk drinking, and then 18.2 abstained from drinking. So about 35 over a third kind of had some sort of recovery in drinking. Opioid treatment options, behavioral issues, uh, behavioral interventions like we talked about, individual therapy, mutual support groups. NA, Narcotics Anonymous, SMART, et cetera, and then medication options. Again, medication, MAT, or Medication Assisted Treatment, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. And then detox centers or residential treatment centers as well for, for recovery. The one thing about medication assisted treatment, I did a presentation last year in this summit about some of the, the myths and some of the facts about medication assisted treatment. Um, so, but, Ultimately, the long and short of that is that MAT, or medication-assisted treatment, works. It is the gold standard of treatment for opioid um, treatment, opioid use disorders. Um, methadone, buprenorphine, or suboxone, naltrexone are medications which are used to help with treatment for this, which for medication-assisted treatment. If we were to, for opioid use, if we stop use after using it, things like, again, heroin, uh, painkillers, um, codeine, et cetera, these things. It's not fatal. Right? We can have very terrible, very uncomfortable, debilitating withdrawal symptoms, which we have over here on the right side, um, and they can last anywhere, anywhere between 72 hours, a week, two weeks, and then a month later. The physical stuff is more in that first week, but then the one thing that causes the main issues with relapsing and kind of struggling to maintain that sobriety or, or that maintenance is that the cravings and the depression really start about two weeks to a month later, and then there's that, that reliving of the experience, the really desire to kind of use again. Benzodiazepines, same kind of stuff. We have mutual support groups, NA, SMART, and something online, there's, it's, it's, there's this online form called Benzo Buddies, uh, which is a online support group uh, where people will kind of help each other through some of not necessarily the withdrawal symptoms, but seeking out help uh, to help or to find a provider or doctor who's able to get them through the tapering process to come off of that medication. And benzodiazepines are medications like Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, uh, Valium. These are some of the more well-known, most commonly used ones. Medication, we use, have to use sometimes the medication to get off of the medication. So it's something called Ashton Protocol. Uh, which is a slow, gradual taper off of benzodiazepines. Again, residential treatment centers and rehab are options as well. The cessation, the main issue with just, again, just purely just stopping something like Xanax if we've been abusing it is that since it works on the same receptor in the brain as alcohol, the same risks are inherent. Shake seizures, cardiac ab abnormalities, and, and death can occur if we just abruptly stop it. So again, that's one of the reasons we do a treatment via a gradual taper. Um, and it's, it's very gradual. You know, it can take months, six months to a year plus if done conservatively. And that's, it's a big investment. It's a time, time investment and, it, and it, it works though when it's done properly. So the next part is the substance use disorders during COVID-19 and some of the unique challenges that are present right now. 
So we have this stay at home order. That was the big, big thing, right? The stay at home quarantine thing. So that involves staying home from school and jobs, houses of worship, recreational places, gyms. And that includes a lot of places, doctor's offices, meetings, treatment centers. So a lot of rehab places kind of shut down or they stopped taking new admissions. I know at my private practice, we stopped having people come in person um, again, that was in the beginning, and we've had to slowly, slowly reintroduce it a little bit. Um, at Keller Center, again, we haven't had an outpatient walk into our office since sometime in March. Um, it's been a long time since we've had people been able to kind of come into the building again. So all these things had all these kind of ripple effects that were honestly intended. And it leads to the saying, right, um, from Proverbs. I'm not usually one to quote the Bible, but it, you know, I, I looked up where this kind of came from, and it was from here. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle lips are his mouthpiece. So we have all these people who are at home with a lot of free time. And they turn to these things which are there to pass time. Um, so social support, that's one of the biggest things that people need when they're really going through treatment for substance use disorders. It is the missing piece oftentimes. That's something when I'm doing an evaluation for somebody to see, hey, how can we help you out the best I always ask, what is your social support? What are those things that you do? We see that substance use is a way to pass time. And oftentimes it is the preferred method of passing time. People will say it, I've come home at five o'clock, I like to have a drink, you know? Or I go home at the end of the day before I go to sleep, after putting the kids to sleep, I like to have a drink. And then it turns into a bottle of wine, right? And when we're working with people and we kind of reduce that, one of the major issues or problems that I hear is that, what do I do with this free time? So people don't even know what to do, right? That's, that's a major problem that happens is that people just don't know what to do with that time. So the other issue is when all the time the world opens up or there's no supervision at work or at school is gone, substance use increases due to increased access. We can start, you know, drinking a little bit early. We can have a little bit of wine with lunch while we're working from home. I can have some marijuana while I'm working from home, right? Because nobody's there to oversee me or no one's there to keep me in check. Um, that's positive. Also the isolation, the stay at home things, right? Stay at home orders and stay away from your friends. Isolation, that anxiety, that mood kind of issues that happen that can lead to unhealthy coping skills via increased use. Stimulus money, unemployment. This is another kind of challenge that popped up is, you know, one of the reasons we're talking to family members of people who are struggling with it is we tell them never give them cash, never give that person cash because where is that money going to go? We know where that money goes to. It goes back into buying substances or to wherever it is. So that's one reason when people are getting these huge checks and then that money's going right back in there. Um, there are people who are actually, you know, getting money, getting more money during this time than they were when they were working their jobs. So there was no financial incentive at the same time to return to work or to break those habit habits. The other thing that was, you know, when this whole stay at home order showed up was that the liquor stores were deemed essential. And for a lot of people, when they saw that it became almost like a joke, um, because people were saying, oh, well, we need to have a little more wine. And you know, we'd see all these memes online, comments about, um, you know, like, why is a liquor store being a, deemed an essential business? And the reason for that is because when we talked about it a little bit before with um, alcohol, if, if we just cut off people's access to alcohol, for those heavy drinkers, again, we saw such a huge numbers of people who have and alcohol use disorders and a good chunk of those people have would have problems if they were just cold turkey unable to get their alcohol that was one of the reasons why because we knew that and if you talk to people if you saw it you know those there was lines out the liquor stores at seven in the morning as soon as they were opening up because that was their medication right that's what they needed to kind of you know not withdraw and to have that was the goal of it. Again, it wasn't necessarily advertised, but the goal was to minimize the risk of withdrawal in these individuals and the subsequent hospitalizations. Again, we talked about these people were ending up for treatment from delirium tremens in the ICU. And when the COVID was happening, all we saw that whole thing, right? All the ICU beds were taken up. So this was there again to really reduce that, that risk of kind of having more people in the hospital in the already attacked system. 
The other thing is the withdrawal could lead to seeking out unsafe alcohol sources, including hand sanitizer. Again, hand sanitizer was a huge thing. Well, remember back in March and April, we, we couldn't buy hand sanitizer anywhere. Alcohol is one of the main constituents of, of it. So people would drink it. Automotive, automotive coolant, people would drink that. Rubbing alcohol, people were drinking that. If you're not able to get your normal bottle of wine or liquor, you go to something else where there's alcohol. And also there were some states, Pennsylvania actually did close down their their liquor stores they said those are non-essential so they were shut down people were traveling out of state so again you were having this spread you have people saying hey stay at home but these people were traveling out of state going out exposing themselves to get alcohol another thing lack of access to treatment aa meetings na smart meetings canceled right and office visits again my office we we had to close everything down um, we couldn't do drug testing Right, one of the main things of treatment with, if you're treating treating a substance use disorder, is sometimes you have to drug test people. You you almost have to drug test them almost every time. So that was on hold. You weren't able to directly do that. Access to delivery, sometimes with methadone. Methadone is a medication that you have to get every day. You have to go to a place, get it in your hand, and you take it in front of that person. With that kind of getting shut down or kind of limited, that's a big barrier. Injections, some of the medication options for people who are on um, getting treatment is they have to get a monthly injection or every couple of weeks an injection. And that's an issue if you can't get that done. Um, and therapeutic support from providers. A lot of times when I have people who are coming to visit with me, they say just talk to them for five, 10 minutes a month is a huge support. So that, that loss of that is gone. And there were some additional returns, so additional kind of um, studies that were done about two months after lockdown to see what were the patterns of drinking that occurred. So with alcohol, we saw that a Lancet survey um, in the UK about two months after they showed there was a 24% of individuals that were surveyed had an increase in alcohol, 90%, 19% actually decreased. 17% um, of those who had been abstinent before COVID and the stay at home orders actually relapsed and 12% actually went from having, you know, actually became abstinent during it. So there was ups and downs, but we saw there was a net positive in drinking and that kind of relapse in people who had been abstinent before. Research in, the, in America, the Nielsen survey system showed that there was a 54% increase in sales of alcohol between March 2020 and March 2019. Online sales increased 500% in late April um, so again, huge increase just in buying of it. And the survey showed that there was a 16% reported, 16% of those surveyed reported an increase in consumption. So again, it just went up. And then with opioids, this is something that was from my presentation last year, but again, just showing you that there was this huge, with opioids, there was a huge increase in deaths that was kind of going up. And we already know that this was just going up and up and up and up and up over the past 10, 20 years, increasing, increasing, increasing. And this, again, just going up and more and more. And this crisis was exacerbated even more. So in 2019, there was an estimated 72,000 drug overdoses. And this number is expected to be shattered in 2020 if it's not already been surpassed. Um, there was the CDC did a survey in June, showed 13% increase or new start in substances since COVID. Wall Street Journal did a survey and they showed that 21 of the 30 top counties in the U.S. had already um, increased, already shown increased overdose deaths with others being able to report. There was also an 18% increase in overdose deaths post a stay-at-home order. Um, so that was sad, right? Unintended consequences of this as well. Social distancing led to using alone a lot. Um, so you're being telling people, hey, don't hang out with your buddies. People would go and use by themselves. And overdoses, when they do occur, as that's something that happens when there is use, they're often reversible with an early enough intervention. We know about naloxone, which is a medication or a treatment which is able to reverse an overdose pretty almost instantly. What happens is when people are in their room and then someone's in another room and someone somewhere else, if somebody overdoses, no one's there to kind of get that help. So a lot of what was happening is that people were overdosing, nobody's there to save them, and then they end up dying when they could have very easily been saved or, or had this overdose, re overdose reversed. Other issue is drug supply gets interrupted, right? 
when all this is happening on a practical level, your supply gets disrupted, your access to what you're used to gets changed or cut off totally. So when you're in that physiological dependence, mental dependence, and you need to get that next fix or the next use, you go to something else. You have to find whatever, whatever, whatever is there available. So you go to unknown alternatives, um, different things, someone that you're not used to buying from, and you get something that may be more potent or maybe more addictive or potentially more dangerous. And then you have overdoses or other kind of issues that can come up with that. Fentanyl, um, I briefly have talked about, was something that had been in there to kind of make it more addictive and more dangerous that's coming out more and more. So how do we put everything all together to help out individuals during this time? Or, or what are some of the issues that things that happen or changes? So COVID-19, we talked about telehealth and telemedicine before. So COVID-19 was really the thing that said, hey, we have to change, we have to push telemedicine. This is the future. And now it's, it's being put out there for everybody. While, again, while research has showed that there had been increase in access and that more and more people had been using telehealth, nothing fast-tracked to this level. So what were some of the changes that occurred? What, one of the changes was that the Ryan Haidt Act that we had talked about before to kind of reduce that potential for misuse or misuse or misuse of the prescribing pad, um, while it had while it was good natured, it also limited ability to help people who would not be able to get help. Also, so people who were coming at it from a clean heart, well intentioned, it limited their ability to help individuals who would not have been able to get that help. So there was a partial or temporary repeal of that act, so people were able to use telemedicine again without that in-person evaluation. There was some relaxation on the, some regulatory requirements. So for like Medicare, Medicaid, they said, hey, we don't need the drug test results. Again, if we're doing it over video, there's no way for me to necessarily get a drug test in my office. So we kind of said, hey, we have to take people at their word. The state licensing requirement was relaxed. A lot of the states said, hey, if you're in a neighboring state, you're able to kind of just come into there and, and kind of reach out into that state. Um, or even other states said, hey, we just need help. So if you're willing to, we'll kind of expedite and kind of relax some of the requirements to get a, a um, state medical license. And also a lot of the insurers were forced into equal reimbursement. So again, that one of that financial barrier to kind of telemedicine was removed to an extent. Some of the transition issues that came up, however, was that some of the places, some of the providers, some of the health systems were not prepared for the switch or didn't have the infrastructure in place for it. Just because you know you and I are using our phones or our computers doesn't mean that everyone's ready to just say, hey, no more in person, let's switch everybody over to online video chats. So this, for some people, pushed people into obs obsolescence. Again, some of the elderly doctors, el elderly providers who were like, you know what, this is it, I'm done. I'm out of the game. And that ended their careers. Um, for people who are not technologically savvy, there is a level of savvy that you need to have. This again, put them out to business, put them out of business. For other people who are like, oh, I'm willing to do this, interruptions or delays in services happened. Um, so there were, you know, articles I was reading again, Wall Street Journal, where they had an individual who was getting out of rehab, but he got out in March, and then when the the things that were initially set up for him, they really felt out of place and he wasn't able to get the care that he needed immediately and he ultimately you know he died because of the fact that he he relapsed the services weren't there for him and he just wasn't able to get that in time because there was again this gap in the surface no one was ready for it to kind of transition to this and sometimes a lot of times there there can be a lack of access to infrastructure or patients well i may have a computer and i may have this wired wonderful connection and be ready to go for this there's no guarantee that my patient are going to be able to do so as well. So benefits from it is it's able to offer continuation of care, increased access, uh, prevention issues. We're able to kind of help to prevent sometimes um, relapsing. And this is something, an adaptation to technology that could increase interest and retention in the future. So it's something that we're hoping we're able to use even in the future to get people more on board. Some of the risks. Again, the biggest concern is that some of these pill mills could come back. Um, so there is, again, that, that concern about that. Um, 
the expedited multi-state licensing, again, that can cause problems with that. And the relaxation of the Ryan Haidt Act, there's, again, those checks and balances kind of go out the window to an extent. Lack of validity and reliability. So how do we kind of make sure that people are saying what we're doing or that they're doing what they say that they're doing? Um, and exposure, right? There's also a risk when there's in person. So in real life, what do we have to do? What, what are those things that we need to work on? We need to be able to have, be ready for a quick transition in technology. Clinical skills really become paramount. So this is when, when people ask me, when I have students that are with me and they say, how do you know, you know if someone's lying to you or not, or if they're telling you the truth is that quote unquote, that gut feeling that comes up over exposure to thousands of patients, right? Those skills, ability to trust somebody, that clinical, that patient doctor relationship rapport is so, so important to be able to say, hey, I can trust you, I don't trust you, or if there's an issue, there's problems, we can really pursue that. People who are a little bit more, or concerned about more, we can require more stringent checking. Uh, we'd go through prescription monitoring program, which is a statewide program, which we can check and see how everybody's doing. And if we're really concerned, we can really send them out to certain labs like Quest, LabCorp, et cetera, to get drug testing done. Education and understanding, we really have to educate our patients about this. And when there is a need for in-person evaluation, we will do it when it's clinically appropriate to do so. So things about the future, um, you know, especially with the repeal of the temporary accommodations, patients are concerned about going back to in-person because there was such excitement about it. U Michigan 2019 showed that telemedicine for substance use disorders was associated with high patient satisfaction scores and was shown to be just as efficacious for in-person interventions, especially for those with uh, limited access to providers. Um, so this was, was shown, what studies have shown that it was very helpful and just, it works just as well. And recommendations are things that people wanted for the future. A development for standardized treatment guidelines. Um, so kind of everyone's flying on their own a little bit. So kind of someone to say in, whether it's DA, whoever to say, hey, let's, this is what we need to do. Increasing access to buprenorphine, which is a treatment for opioid use disorders, the increased trainings and certifications and increased access for those with co-occurring mental health disorders via online therapy or groups. I think I got it in just in time. So any questions, any concerns, things that can help us. Dr. Mirza, thank you so much. I really appreciated that you went through some of the definitions that people you know, may confuse and you made sure that we all understood that and kind of went through some of the history. Um, I do have some questions here for you. Uh, the first one that I wanted to go into was, do you have um, any information on dependence on medicine? So maybe not necessarily, you know, an illicit drug or alcohol, but maybe a medicine that you, someone has been prescribed. Um, in regards to like, what, sorry. To maybe a prescription medicine. So I guess someone's starting to abuse that versus, you know, a traditional illicit drug. Yeah, so that kind of falls in. Um, we, we see those that are, the ones that are mostly abused are the opioid painkillers. That was kind of, we talked about a little bit. Uh, we also see the issues with the benzodiazepines, things like again, Xenexes or Clonopins, Ativans, and also things like stimulants um, to an extent. So those fall into that same category. And we, we recommend that same kind of concern just saying, hey, we wanna make sure that we keep track of how people are using their medications, are people using more than they need to? Um, again, whether that's just counting um, more than they're prescribed, or if we see any kind of changes in mental status, if we're having, if we're seeing any aberration in behavior, or kind of again going back to what we define as a substance use disorder, um, any kind of inadequacies in social life, occupational life, health-wise, any risks that come about from that. Thank you. I have another question that's kind of along the same lines. Why isn't sugar considered an abused substance? <laughs> it, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> um, it's controversial in a way because um, sugar, while it's been shown to be um, have negative health effects, there isn't necessarily per se a perceived high that comes, a, comes across the same way as something as um, cocaine, for example, is, or heroin is. Um, so that's 
one of the main differences. There are absolutely health issues that can come across from too much sugar, diabetes, et cetera. Um, but it's more that, and then, you know, again, the a topic for a whole other day is the whole lobbying aspect of the sugar, sugar boards and sugar companies. Sure, you could talk for hours on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I have another question here for you. So building a rapport with substance abuse clients who are pre-contemplative or contemplative, particularly teens, can be a struggle when in person. Any thoughts or suggestions on doing so when in a virtual session? It's, it's very similar. Um, people, a lot of the questions that we got when we were transitioning to televisits. Tele um, and this is something I have been doing for four years, um, either in my private practice and during my training as well as, and especially when you're starting out, even on my end, I was like, how, you know, how is this going to work? Is it going to be the same thing? But you see very quickly is that people get very adjusted to it and you're able to kind of have that the same kind of rapport. Um, you know, one of the benefits per se of something like psychiatry or something like mental health counseling therapy is that I don't need to put my hands on you, right? I don't need to put a you know, stethoscope on you. I don't need to have those things, right? I don't need that physical contact per se. And sometimes that, you know, a lot of times, especially if we're really going by psychotherapy kind of traditions is that the physical contact is, is deterred. You know, it's not something that you want to have. Um, so that's, you know, we're able to see that again when we're in practice that that connection that rapport is still builds up. You know, we use it on a day to day day to day basis a lot of times, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, that you're still able to have that connection to an extent. So that's it's not always a it's, it comes across much easier than a lot of people think it is, think it does. Thank you. I have, another, I have two questions actually that might refer back to charts that you showed earlier in your presentation. So you might have to scroll back for us. The first mm -hmm. one is, do you have any statistics on alcohol and substance abuse for adolescents and young adults since the pandemic began? Not since the pandemic began. Um, there, the, the surveys that were done by um, the Lancet and UK and the Nielsen See if I can find those a little bit here just for the more post COVID um, information. Those were done mostly phone surveys or through clinic patients. And these were mostly for, I think these are all both exclusively for adults. I, I don't have the numbers for um, children, adolescents, because they're just not out yet. Okay, thank you. The second question is I think you had a chart that showed the different ethnicities and um, how they were abusing substance or the percentage of the population. So what explains that disparity in substance abuse between the ethnicities? There isn't, here it is, here it is. Um, there isn't anything necessarily that explains the major differences. Again, this is more um, Historically, there was amongst this population, the Native American and all in Alaskans, the, um, actually, sorry, I misspoke. There is a genetic, a, a specific gene that this population has where um, they are more susceptible to um, alcohol addiction or dependency. Um, so that's something that is there. Again, we've historically, we've seen that this is one of the main issues amongst this, this pop ethnic group is that substance issues are so high amongst them and they devastate them. Um, so, and you can kind of see also amongst this group, they're not necessarily significantly different. They're only just, again, and then Native American specific and Asian Americans are maybe a little bit more of a cultural aspect of as, it, as well. Asian American or Asian populations don't have as much of an emphasis or a normative quality of alcohol in their cultural day-to-day -day life as compared to um, whites, blacks, Latinos. Um, even also then kind of physiologically, a lot of Asians, not only a lot of Asians, but a decent amount of Asians have a negative reaction, almost an allergy. They get the flushing that occurs when they do drink alcohol, which is a deterrent to drink. Um, if you're gonna have a, a reaction, it's that, that Asian redness that can, you know, as it's known, can pop up and show as a deterrent for use of it. Thank you for answering that. 
Um, I have another question here. Um, I'm not, not sure if this is too specific for you to comment on, but I will ask it. Um, if you are working in person, if you are working with a person, say you're working in a person that is seeing in-person patients when inducing them on Suboxone, after how many positive BUP negative or other substance readings would you recommend before transitioning the patient to telehealth? There isn't a specific number. Um, again, it, it comes down to clinical training, clinical expertise, clinical comfort levels. There are definitely people that, you know, that you want to have more in-person visits again. And again, if you notice there's some kind of discrepancies that occur, you're always able to kind of refer out to say, hey, I just, you know, I just something doesn't feel right or we're noticing behaviors or we're getting a call from family members saying like, hey, there's an issue or something just feels wrong to kind of refer out and get that additional check that's done, um, whether it's through, again, testing at a, at a lab or an urgent care, just to kind of get that check. So you have to look at, again, the whole support system. If somebody is living all alone and they're unemployed, um, they may have had some jail time. Your clinical suspicion may be a little bit more like I'm not quite fully, fully comfortable. And they've had, and they, you can look through the history and you can look through all these things, whether it's prescription and monitoring program, then they're, they're shown that, that there, there's been some issues with it. You're gonna, they're going to be considered a higher risk kind of patient and you would want them to have more kind of checks that are there. Um, so whether that is saying, hey, we want you to still come in or we want you to get your checks every time and no matter what, then that's that. If there's somebody who has a good support system, social support system, they're working, they have a family, they come in, they're motivated. Um, that transition, that accountability, that honesty is something that you would kind of have to, that you may come through a little bit earlier rather than later. Hope Thank that answers you. it. Thanks, Dr. Mirza. And that was actually uh, the last question that we had time to ask. But thank you again so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you giving your time to us, especially while you're on vacation. Thank you so, so much for being here. For okay. more information on the remaining webinars or for resources on substance abuse and addiction, please visit actonaddictionnow.org. We are also putting this link in the chat. Our next webinar is called, When Enough is Enough, Disrupting the Reward and Addiction Process with Nat Nguyen on Tuesday, September 29th at noon. We, would also, we are gonna be putting that uh, information in the chat as well. We'd be so appreciative if you, all, if you all could take our survey. The link is also gonna be put in the chat. Uh, this will help us evaluate our sessions for this year and provide vital information to shape next year's conference, whether virtual or in-person. Thank you all so much again for joining us today and we hope to see you at the next webinar.